health care is an important issue. Uh, as a member of the baby boom generation, first of all, I'd like to apologize to all of you for, uh, for being partly responsible for bringing this uh, to the point where it is such an issue and such a financial burden. That's why I want all of you young people in the audience to get to graduate and get good jobs, because perhaps that's ultimately what my health care depends on. <coughs> but the good news for uh, those of you who fear what the baby boom generation may have done to the United States is that the baby boom generation has also produced leading experts and incisive thinkers like Dr. Everett. And so perhaps uh, her work uh, will help uh, mitigate somewhat the impact of our, our numbers as we move uh, through the demographics of, of, of American society and create more and more demands for medical care. Dr. Everett is president of the New England uh, Healthcare Institute. Uh, she has been responsible for organizing and gaining funding and publishing uh, important research in a number of healthcare issues, especially with patient safety, healthcare technology. Um, I heard her give a talk this, uh, this week, earlier this week, at the Indianapolis campus about why uh, individuals like you and me often fail to take our pills on time and maintain our pill regimen. So she works both at a macro level of health care uh, issues, uh, impacting, impacting on the national debate, and I think she has the capacity to answer your own questions uh, with problems you may have when she is, <laughs> is done. Uh, but we'll see how that uh, uh, emerges and evolves today. Her talk today is entitled Health and Healthcare 2020 Back to the Future. So I give you Wendy effort. Thanks, John. Um, I am completely thrilled to be here today. It's an honor and a privilege to have been invited to give the Brannigan Lecture. And I just would have one caveat, which is, John, there is no way you were old enough to be in the baby boomer generation. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. I am. He's not. Um, so we're going to start this afternoon's talk um, by looking back before we look forward. Um, before I started NEHI, I ran a um, health policy think tank on the West Coast that did a lot of forecasting in healthcare. Um, we would spend an, an enormous amount of time trying to think about what were some of the trends and the trajectories so that people could start to plan for things that had a high likelihood of happening. And the way that you go about developing a forecast, there's a little bit of a science to it. And the first thing you do is you always have to take a look back. You can't just sit there and try to find that thin line between your vision and your hallucination and say, where are we going to go? You look back. So um, for those of you who were actually alive in 1985, and there was a wonderful movie um, that actually was an Oscar-winning film at the time. It starred Mar Michael J. Fox. And essentially, his future, he's Marty McFly in the film, is not shaping up too well at the moment. He's a teenager. He's not too happy. His family's dysfunctional. His school teacher hates him. He doesn't get along very well with his kids. However, he does have a terrific girlfriend, and he has a kind of local eccentric scientist whose name is Doc Brown. And the two of them really encourage him in all of his life. And so Doc Brown goes and he creates um, a time travel machine call out of a DeLorean car. Some of us will remember what the DeLorean looked like. Um, and in this time machine, he's able to take people back. He's able to take Marty McFly back to 1955. There, Marty stumbles upon a much younger version of his parents. And the kind of theme of the movie is that his parent, he interrupts the point where his parents meet. And so he has to work really, really hard to get them back together again, or he will never be born. 
Um, so that's the kind of synopsis there. Now, what's, Im what's important about looking backward? We can go back to get data and to try to see where we've been over time so that when we sit down to say what events are going to happen and are going to affect us in the future, we have a really good context in which um, to think about this. So in 1955, our life expectancy was 69 years of age. Now, in 1900, just at the turn of the century, it was 47 years of age. So through the first part of the century, through sanitation improvements, through the development of penicillin, um, we made some enormous strides, most of them in the environment, not in the scientific world. Um, we had 165 million people in this country. What was fascinating to me was I went back to look at some of the age distributions, and there were only four and a half million people over the age of, of 75 in 1955. Now, keep that in mind when um, John was talking about what the baby boomers are going to be doing to healthcare. And when we move forward a little bit and talk about the importance of aging in this country, remember this number. President Eisenhower had a heart attack. He was in the hospital for three weeks. Cardiac catheterization did not exist. Coronary bypass didn't exist. And we really didn't even have the drugs that people take now. You had a heart attack. You went in the hospital. You rested. You got out of the hospital. Fortunately, he did well. Um, the drug prednisone was developed. And there are a couple of little metrics that um, are important to me. One is baseball. Um, the other is looking just for a little financial metric we can track through time. So the Dodgers won the World Series, um, and the first class stamp cost three cents. OK, what, what was health care like in 1955? This is the Mayo Clinic. Um, arguably still one of the very best healthcare delivery systems in the country. And you can see that things were relatively unsophisticated and relatively primitive. When you went to see the doctor, you lined up. Um, physicians walked down the line. They saw patients. They didn't have MRI machines or a lot of ultrasounds. They had a stethoscope. They had a tongue depressor. Um, and they used their training and their clinical skills to provide medical care. This was the essence of medical technology in 1955. Um, my husband is a physician and a uh, medical school professor, and to this day, uh, he still will say that the telephone is probably the most advanced technologies that physicians in, in um, their small practices will use, um, but relatively primitive. And this is very interesting. So still in 1955, uh, Homer Warner at the Beth Israel Hospital created the first medical computer. One computer, it takes up this entire room. Um, but it was the beginning. It was where things started. And so. Um, if we fast forward a bit to try to get a little bit um, of a snapshot 30 years later, what's changed? So again, we're trying to build the context for where we might want to go. Well, the life expectancy by 1985 had improved considerably. We're at a life expectancy of 75 years. The US population has now grown to a point where there are 238 million people. Rock Hudson dies of AIDS. Um, so AIDS had just really been discovered in 1982 when we saw the first Kaposi sarcoma. Um, here we are 25 years later. AIDS is still a major, particularly global, health problem. 
Um, the scanning microscope was introduced when we look at some of the medical technologies. Kansas City won the World Series and the cost of a first class stamp had risen from three cents in 1955 to 20 cents. So as we look at advances in medical technology, this is the first cell phone. Um, and this is the first phone call that was made on the first cell phone in 1973. This is Martin Cooper. Um, he was a manager of communications for Motorola. Um, and he was very involved in the development of that. So it was really his vision that got us the cell phone and that moved us into that realm of communications again for physicians. So that the technologies were not what they are now, but certainly a major improvement over the rotary telephone from before. Computers now have appeared on desktops. They're not portable, they're not on your PDA, but it's the first opportunity that physicians and hospitals and clinicians have to start to really have access to the data that they need to take care of you. And so a major advance there in the 30 years. So let's quickly kind of just jump forward again to what's roughly um, present time before we move on to 2020. Our life expectancy is now 78 years on average, 80 years from women, for women. So remember, think back to um, 67 years in uh, 1955. Our U.S. population is now 308 million people, and it is growing. Now, what was kind of fascinating to me was in trying to follow the different age cohort trends um, because that our aging ties into the prevalence of our chronic illness, and that's a lot of what is generating changes both in the delivery system and in our payment systems. Um, we currently have 104,000 people who are over 100 years old. Um, now, two things you might not know is that when Willard Scott was the weatherman on the Today Show, every morning he would sing happy birthday to every person in the country who turned 100 that day. It was kind of cute. Um, today, if Willard were still doing this, there would be 371 people every single day that he would have to send to, that he would have to sing happy birthday to. And the president sends a personal letter to every person in the country who turns 21. So, who turns 100. <laughs> 21 would be kind of cool. <laughs> So um, we're, you know, we're starting to see uh, taking care of people who are 100 years old is very different from even taking care of the folks who are 65 and starting to go into the Medicare population. Cancer has now replaced heart disease as the number one um, chronic illness that we're dealing with because we've now learned how to treat people with cancer so that they stay alive. Um, as we think about advances in medical technology, Gardasil, which is a drug, a vaccine, um, to immunize young people against the HPV virus that causes cervical cancer that was approved in 2006. I don't care who won the World Series, except that the Red Sox won in 2004. Um, and what is kind of cute and very interesting is um, who knows what a first class stamp cost anymore. Um, essentially, the young people um, here don't bother to use stamps as much anymore as we have shifted to other ways of communicating. So um, as we look specifically at some of the technologies that we're using to communicate today, um, the cell phones have improved to the point where they will be the next mechanism for communicating between you and your clinician. 
Um, we think back to 1955 and that entire room for one computer. <coughs> now, patient in complete patient record, and many of them can be seen on a tablet computer, can be taken from room to room, from office to hospital, so that we have much more ubiquitous and easily accessible information. Um, so that's where we've been. I think the question now is, where are we going to go? What are some of the interesting innovations and technologies that we'll see over the next five to 10 years? Um, starting to think about how it is that we promote disease prevention and really have an opportunity to improve our health. Vaccines are a very important element of these improvements in medicine. If you just look at this little chart, in the year 1900, um, 48,000 people died from smallpox, 175,000 from diphtheria, 16,000 from polio, and half a million people died from measles. Now, given the levels of vaccination and immunization that we've had since then, you can see the differences. And for each dollar spent in vaccinations and immunizations, we save um, just under $6. So this is an incredibly cost-effective mechanism that falls into the realm of public health um, and is critical. This is the way we have always vaccinated people. Um, it's not particularly pleasant. It still happens. We haven't made a lot of progress in that technology. But what we are going to be doing in the future is switching from injections to providing vaccines through certain food groups. Now, the banana turns out to be a particularly effective way of delivering vaccines. Um, it doesn't perish very quickly. It comes in its own container so that you can infuse the vaccine into the banana and then um, it stays covered up. And basically, it's a food that's cheap and easily accept accessible throughout the world. So we're not having to deal with the very complicated problems of shipping medicines to developing countries and then not having a distribution system within the country in order to get medicines to folks. Um, the new vaccines that are being developed now will make even more progress as we go forward um, sometime we hope between 2015 and 2020, we'll see vaccines for meningococcal men meningitis, for the rotaviruses, which really exist in the developing world, um, cause blindness in children, cause death, um, are a huge problem in um, the very high poverty countries. Um, we're very close to seeing a vaccine going into clinical testing for HIV. Um, there is a vaccine about to come out of phase three trial for hepatitis C, which again is a little less of an issue in this country, but globally a huge problem. And two weeks ago, I got my flu shot, which had H1N1, and this year's best guess at what the flu will look like. Um, what, what the scientists are working on now is a universal flu vaccine that will remain stable year to year. So kind of as we look forward, a lot of the diseases um, that are infectious diseases and acute diseases, we're going to be able to develop vaccines for so that we won't be quite as vulnerable to these. Now, that um, certainly ties into uh, the shift that we'll talk about in a moment between acute illnesses and chronic illnesses. So let's look at a, at a second major medical advance, and that is the use of sensors. You can see a sensor here. 
Um, they're very small chips. I'm sure in the next five years they will get to be minuscule chips. They cost less than a penny, so this is kind of a fast, cheap, and easy technology. They're ubiquitous in our lives. I mean, my car is 20 times smarter than I am. And it's because it is completely embedded with sensors. It not only knows when I get in, it knows when I'm about to run out of gas, it knows when the rear brake is out. Um, it's amazing. So the question is, is there a way for us to use sensors to improve our health care? Now, we do a lot of work with an organization called DARPA. It's a little scary. It's a military group called the, Deva the um, Department of Applied Research Programs, and it's an agency, so they stick the A on the end. And they do a lot of very forward-thinking um, science in trying to apply things from the outside world to medicine. They're also uh, a group that basically, once you really know how they do it, they do say, um, we'll have to kill you. So this is a sensor, completely sensor embedded stretcher that was developed during the Gulf, the first Gulf War. Um, this gurney and this set of medics go out onto the battlefield. They will take a victim, put it on the gurney, that person on the gurney, and there are sensors throughout this gurney that send all of the physiologic data that it registers for that person back to a base camp where the physicians can analyze it. And then they call the paramedics in the field and say, start this treatment. So what it was able to do during um, the Gulf War was to provide very early treatment for wounded soldiers on the battlefield. Um, and this saved enormous numbers of lives. Um, so what's happened um, since then is this technology has been commercialized. And in just a few hospitals around the country, um, they have taken the same concept, completely embedded the, the patient bed in the intensive care unit with these sensors so that the bed now knows when your oxygen saturation levels are starting to go down and it automatically sends a wireless signal to the oxygen machine on your bed and increases the amount of oxygen you get. So no, we no longer have to wait to the point where you start to get a little short of breath and have to call the nurse who may or may not be there. This is all done in kind of a closed soup circuit loop. It's the same with the drugs um, and the IV system. It monitors every conceivable uh, physiologic data point that you might have. Now, as you can imagine, um, this technology is very expensive. And so it's just now starting out. Northrop Grumman makes these beds. I think uh, UCLA has 10 of them. But if we think to the future, um, obviously, as with other technologies, the cost is going to come down. We hope the performance will also increase, kind of a Moore's Law principle that we hope works here. Um, and we'll see hospitals starting to adopt these technologies. The advantage is that it prevents someone from getting sicker and allows um, people to intervene and make sure that they don't go south. Um, remote telemonitoring is another technology, information technology for those of you in the room who are interested in computer sciences that we're starting to see now, but that is just taking off. And this is a photograph of a physician at Lehigh University. Those eight computer screens you see are monitoring one patient. So he is 300 miles away from a patient in an intensive care unit, but he is actually providing direct care to that patient. 
Um, so on one screen, on the screen on the right, you can see the patient. The resolution of the video is such that you can do a retinal exam remotely from here. You can see into the eye. He also is monitoring all of the things that are happening. So what's her heart rate? What's her blood pressure? What's her oxygen level? Um, and he starts to see small changes. One other screen has a whole set of protocols and guidelines for what to do when you see those small changes. So if you were to think about your daughter, your mother, being in the intensive care unit, um, this would seem to be a situation where the technology is really going to help that person get better care. So on the, on the patient end, this is a patient in neurosurgical ICU at UCLA, and um, in the background you can actually see, the ro this is a robot, and the robot has a computer screen for a head so you can move it room to room. Um, and the patient can see the physician and talk to the doctor. So it's, it's a two-way communication that allows us to provide critical care in rural areas, um, in places where the number of beds in a critical care unit could be not quite enough to warrant um, having full-time critical care staff. So as we look to the future, these things will become more and more routine. This in-touch robot is now being used in emergency departments, in rural hospitals where people don't have access to physicians. So you'll get a physician to um, kind of dial in and be able to diagnose whether or not you have a sprained ankle, a broken ankle, or you just don't feel too well. Um, another application of this combination of medical technology and information technology is home monitoring. So for patients with chronic illnesses, particularly multiple chronic illnesses, uh, they're able to step on a scale at home, push a button, answer a few questions, and the data are all set sent electronically to the physician's office. So if someone has congestive heart failure and they've gained three pounds overnight, uh, the physician can call, see that, can call them and say, honey, you need to take two more of those little yellow pills. And that ultimately can prevent the patient from having to be hospitalized. And we talk about hospitalizations in terms of healthcare costs. And I think that's because I've been talking about health reform all week. But it also, from the patient point of view, is wonderful to not have to go spend 10 days in a cardiac care unit. What a concept. Let's try to keep people healthy enough so that they can stay at home. Um, this, the process works this way. You get the data sent to a nurse, um, and you get a call from the physician. So we've moved over time from um, kind of the Norman Rockwell concept of every interaction between a patient and a physician takes place in the office to now where we have home telemonitoring to the future where basically all of these sensors are going to be embedded in things that we wear. So if I go back to the example of the DARPA folks, 10 years ago, I was at a small invited conference at Johns Hopkins, and DARPA it, itself, the physicians in DARPA, had gotten a group of Yale medical students um, to volunteer to go to base camp um, at Mount Everest and to get to base camp, and they had completely sensor-embedded vests on them that measured every conceivable thing. So they had a live feed from Mount Everest to us at Johns Hopkins, and we all had computers in front of us, um, and essentially, we could see them on the screen, so it was all real time. And remember, this is 10 years ago. So the, the surgeon, who's a, a, a wonderful guy, 
uh, could communicate, and he asked them to all lie down in the snow, do snow angels, and push a button on their sensor-embedded vest. And what we saw, what I saw in the computer in front of me, was their EKG. Um, so when you just think about the power of sensors that we could wear, I could have diagnosed and treated that kid up on the top of Mount Everest from where I was sitting at Johns Hopkins. Um, so we're going to see this more and more, um, and we are going to also see sensors within the home. So there's a, um, a really interesting and very progressive group looking at the future of healthcare in Rochester, New York. Um, it's run by a woman physician who is the sister of the guy who founded the MIT Media Lab. So there must be something in their DNA that gets them excited about these things. So, so here you see throughout, and they have built a prototype of this home and have been testing it out for about five years. It's primarily designed for older people, but essentially there are places um, in the home where um, you can, through a sensor-embedded Band-Aid, you can know whether or not your cut is infected. Um, and these exist now. I've seen them. I've used them. They're not quite available in your local CVS, but they will be soon enough. Um, when she looks into the mirror, there are sensors there that, again, can do a retinal exam. Um, and if she's a diabetic, can feed some information both back to her and back to her physician. So you, you have ways, not just around medication adherence and um, did I take my pill today, but of really um, trying to help older people with multiple chronic illnesses stay at home. Because long term, that's what we all want. And long term, I think um, the ability of medical science, particularly the computer sciences, to enable us to do that will be remarkable. OK, so we have these great emerging technologies, but we're just parking them on the most broken healthcare delivery system. Um, it's not exactly MASH, but it's not exactly too much better than MASH. So what are we going to do longer term um, in order to improve that service delivery system? Now, we've been, um, I've made this point a couple of, of times um, during the lectures that I've been privileged to give here. And that is that we are saying now, where we spend 17 and a half percent of our gross domestic product on health care, um, we're saying it is unsustainable going forward. And I just would point out to you that in the Nixon administration in 1974, um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services made a major public announcement saying that the fact that this country was spending 5.5% of its GDP on health care was unsustainable. He used the same words. So clearly, for us as a society, health care is a very important good. And we are sustaining the increase in costs. Um, and we haven't, to date, done very much uh, to really change them. But one could argue that we're very near to a tipping point. Um, we have extraordinary rising costs. Uh, right now, almost five, the medical cost growth is almost five times um, the consumer price index growth. So, and there is no end in sight. Um, the Medicare and Medicare every year puts out a projection of how much our health care is going to cost us 10 years out. 
last week they came out with that projection and said in 2019 we will be spending 4.6 trillion dollars on health care and that will be just about 22 percent of our gross domestic product now there's a big if there and a big opportunity and that is if and unless we do something about those rising costs. And the important piece of that is there's only one pie, so if we're spending um, even 17.5% of our GDP on healthcare, it has to come from somewhere else. And when you analyze where it's coming from, it's coming from public health efforts, and it's coming from funding for higher education. So those are the two places that are suffering at the hands of our cost increases. Second, we do have what we kind of tongue-in-cheek refer to as the silver tsunami. And third, we have an extraordinary epidemic of obesity and the chronic illness that's associated with obesity. So let's just quickly look at these things. Um, these are mind-numbing graphs, don't pay a lot of attention to them, um, except to see that for the first time um, in the, the 2000s, we've seen the amount that the family pays for Medicare um, exceed the amount that they pay for food and for housing and for clothing and shoes. So this is very important when you start to look at low-income families and populations. Um, they are spending more for medical care than they are spending for any other part of a necessity in life. Um, we're losing ground in our um, health benefits the amount of money that employers have to spend in order to pay for health insurance. We have both a low growth scenario um, and a more, what we think is a more realistic scenario. Um, this is health benefit expense as a percent of corporate after-tax pro profits. Um, and we're also seeing projections for when we will no longer have money to fund Medicare. Now, if the health reform program that we just passed is as effective as we hope it will be, uh, these numbers will change completely. But the cost control part really hasn't yet um, been implemented. So you can see that the projections are that Medicare will go bankrupt in 2013, 2016, or 2020. Um, I'm certainly hopeful, as John might be, that these numbers get pushed out considerably over time. Um, but the cost pressures are enormous. And the hope now is that we've made the decision to provide access to folks, that that's going to force us to figure out very creative and innovative ways to control costs so that the 30 to 40 million uninsured people that will benefit from universal coverage um, will actually have money to pay for that. So the silver tsunami, here's your centurion club. Um, I told you that we now have 104,000 um, folks over 100. In 2050, there will be 670,000 people in this country over 100. Now what that's going to mean is that pretty soon, since we're looking at 2020 here, we're going to have to start to think very creatively about housing and about social services. Um, where are these folks going to be living? In assisted care facilities, in nursing homes? Nursing homes will have to change. Um, this actually moves the Willard Scott number up to about 3,000 people a day. So um, you have to kind of see the context here. But the, this, this population is aging, and the world is having the same experience. In 2015, there will be 6 million people worldwide over 100 years old. So um, try to imagine 
what their health problems will be, and how we are going to care for them. Um, so in 2010, we have about 30 million people over 65, and the projection is by 2050 that will have doubled to over 70 million. Um, 2020, we're still going to be up between 40 and 50 million. So big pressures on the, Medic on the Medicare Trust Fund um, and big pressures in trying to help this particular aging population deal with chronic illnesses. So as we go to the third major driver of what we'll be seeing um, in 2020, obesity right now is our most critical public health issue. This year, it surpassed smoking as being the biggest contributor to death and disability in the country. Um, it certainly made the cover of time in 2004. If we look at this epidemic, the number of people with chronic conditions in the millions is rising, um, certainly highly correlated with the increase that we're seeing in age but also correlated to our lifestyles. Um, I really had the privilege to uh, talk at great length about um, aging, ob aging obesity and the environmental factors that are affecting the increase in obesity at lunch today with the Wells Scholars. Um, and we had some, uh, some great ideas. So this is a hungry man breakfast. You can find it in any grocery store, pretty much in any city or town. If you take a look, it's got about 1,200 calories in it, um, 61 grams of fat, 21 grams of which are saturated. Um, it's got about 1,800 milligrams of sodium, which could get you by for a couple of days. It's got a little dietary fiber, if you're interested in fiber in your diet. Um, but what's important to know is that this is a day to a day and a half's worth of total nutrition, and people in, the, in this country are eating this for breakfast. Um, so we need to think about kind of what's going on in the environment that's help kind of not just helping people gain weight, but essentially creating more and more limited choices for ways to eat in healthy manners. And there are certainly lots of pockets around the country and lots of people who are doing very interesting things to turn this around, um, but in truth, not enough. Um, so as we as we look to 2020, what are what are how do we bring um, what's happening with the population, what's happening in medical technology, um, and and what the cost pressures are together into just a couple of trends? Um, so first, we're going to see a lot more individual involvement in healthcare. Second. Um, we're going to see a shift in the site of care, which we call the expansion of health. Um, and third, we're going to be seeing people um, really starting to look at the value of the care they're purchasing. So um, we're going to be kind of, you're going to be the person of the year in the Time magazine cover. Um, but what tools are we going to have to help you? So this is a screenshot of a, of a new company in a program called 23andMe. How many of you have signed up for 23andMe? <laughs> Two of us, okay. Um, essentially, 23andMe is a little program where you um, give them some of your DNA and they completely analyze your risk for certain diseases. Um, and there's a lot of ethical controversy ar about this at the moment. A lot of it justified. Their tests are not perfect. Um, they are giving you information, and they do give it to you in context. So it's risks, and it's risks within a population. 
Um, but I learned from this that I am not at risk in terms of my genetic makeup for Parkinson's disease. Um, and they have a list, uh, a list that expands every day of um, conditions and diseases that do have a genetic association to them where you can get your own personal profile. They also have um, this kind of, I'm going to say goofy, you may disagree, um, aspect to the program, well, they will match your genetic profile to everyone else who has enrolled in 23andMe around the world. And that turns out to be a lot of people. And then they will send you back a note saying, we think you have a third cousin in Yugoslavia um, just by your DNA makeup. Do you have any interest in getting t in touch with this person? Um, now, I really haven't. But um, other people, when you think about social marketing and what, what people do on Facebook, friending each other, you may be wanting to friend your genetically matched cousin in Yugoslavia. Um, a kind of second example of the programs that are uh, coming to fruition is a great program called Patients Like Me. Any of you in here know it, used it? Um, it's, a, it's a company and uh, I think actually a nonprofit organization that was founded by a young Harvard Business School graduate. And it's a place where you can go to talk online to people who have diseases like you. And by and large, they are the more rare diseases. So it's uh, a way to find people who are like you who are sick. Um, so uh, the woman, the young woman who actually runs my institute has a son who was born with um, his liver not connected up to his blood vessels. Um, it's a condition called biliary atresia. It's unbelievably rare. And she uses patients like me to find all of the other moms in the country who have children like this. And they share information, they share treatment, they share who are the best physicians in the country. It's, it's a way to start to have the patients actually kind of take charge and take control here. Um, there's a next evolution of home monitoring. Uh, this is a, a patient of ours in the north end um, of uh, Boston. He's an older Italian gentleman. Uh, we were sure he'd never use a computer. We brought this little gizmo into his house. And it's advanced in that it doesn't just ask him for his blood pressure and um, his oxygenation, but it asks him a lot of questions about how he's feeling and what's his level of social isolation and is he eating and sleeping. So, so we need to get beyond just the medicalization of this and start to think about what in the future um, is going to help us both get well and stay well. So we can see the expansion of healthcare as it's moving um, from where it used to be to the home, to the retail clinics now, which give you a lot of convenience, um, to the work site. And um, we have talked a little bit about how you will have sensors in your eyeglasses that will um, essentially measure all of your eye health. Um, so that's how things will be going tomorrow. And we've got these very sophisticated new ways of looking at how you can develop your own medical record and keep it with you, use it, um, make sure that all of your care providers are up to date. Um, alternative medicine. Uh, in the next five to 10 years, I think is going to grow much more than we've seen it in the past. And that's going to put a major challenge and stress on the healthcare system per se, because they're going to have to now integrate alternative care into the entire patient profile. 
Um, in terms of primary care, I think by 2020, we will see very few physicians working in onesies, twosies practices. Um, there are so many economies of scale, particularly when it comes to young people demanding having an electronic medical record, whether it's their own or whether it's one that their physicians have. You need to either be in a virtual pr group practice or in a real group practice in order to make that work. Um, I'll kind of skip over the outcomes piece and talk just for a moment about really the entry of employers into the healthcare field. And I know that um, you've had some discussion about this here at IU, um, but if it's any consolation, this is something that is happening all over the country. Um, what's a, what we don't realize, I think, is that there is an enormous hit on productivity for people whose health is not well managed. And it's both abs lost work days on an individual basis. Um, it's lo lost work days if you are taking care of a parent um, or a child. But then there's this concept of presenteeism where you have asthma, you really don't feel too well, you're not well managed, and um, you go to work anyway. So you're working at about a third to a half speed. And this is very important to the economic competitiveness of not just the companies, but the state and the nation. Um, so here's a, uh, something that may seem even more draconian than what you're facing here. And that is General Mills has taken this very seriously. And over the past five years, essentially, you have the option of having the desk removed from your office and a treadmill placed in there instead. <laughs> now, this may not be the most appealing feature to you, but for someone for whom it's really difficult to get exercise and you're motivated, um, your uh, computer screen is right there. And for if you wanted to be on that treadmill for eight consecutive hours and still continue to write your strategic plans and to do your emails, um, you could do that. They have had amazing take up on this. Um, now, someone doesn't have to use it for the whole eight hours, but um, rather than sacrifice your lunch hour or rather to have to get up at, oh, dark o'clock in the morning in order to go running, you have a little extra time in your life. And with the blessing and encouragement of the company, you can exercise and work simultaneously. Um, many, many employers have completely changed their cafeteria offerings. Um, and for those of you interested in and concerned about individual rights, um, you can still get a triple cheeseburger with fries. It just will cost you about $50. So they've managed to do some interesting pricing to help people make healthy choices. Um, and for General Mills, they also hold weekly um, screenings and they have enormous team-based competitions. Um, a different variety of this is that Scott Lawn Products um, essentially went to a fairly draconian uh, position and uh, let go all of their smokers. So they gave people an opportunity and the support to stop smoking if they chose not to and they failed their nicotine spit test, um, they were let go. Um, obviously very controversial, but they said this is a known health risk. Um, we are not going to endorse it by continuing to employ you. So just to, just to finish up, um, many of you have seen the slide this week. Um, if right now the different elements that make up our health status and whether we're sick or well, about 10% of it is whether we have access to medical care. 
20% are our genetics, whether or not our parents and grandparents had heart disease or diabetes. 20% uh, is whether we live and work in a place with clean air and clean water. But 50% are these 10 major health behaviors over which we have complete control. Do we smoke? Do we eat well? Do we exercise? Do we wear helmets on our motorcycles? Do we wear seat belts? Kind of all of the things that we know about. Right now, um, we spend about 88% of this $2.6 trillion on the 10% um, of the, our health status that is due to the care system. Um, we spend right now about 3% on trying to change our health behaviors so that they move in the right direction. So kind of maybe this is my hallucination, but I think as we look at the basic tenets of health reform and we look at um, the educational programs, the regulation, the taxation uh, that is going on here, my hope is that by 2020, if we really are <coughs> spending $4.6 trillion, that the shift is quite dramatic and that we're spending 50% on actual medical care and much closer to 50% on trying to change our health behaviors. So kind of each of the different players in healthcare has some very interesting challenges but some wonderful technologies uh, to move forward in the next five uh, to 10 years. Um, and one of the things I thought I would end with is if you go and look at the movies that talk about the future. So we started with Michael J. Fox and Back to the Future. When Total Recall came out, I think in 2007, um, it, it essentially predicted whole body scanning, which didn't exist at that time. Um, but if you go through Reagan National Airport at this point, you have no choice. You have a total body scan. And certainly we've had them in healthcare for quite a long time. Um, if you look at Minority Report, um, which came out, I think, in 2005 with Tom Cruise, well, he had multi-touch interfaces. Um, and as you saw in our tele-ICU example, which is now just in demonstration, but will be um, the kind of mode by 2020. It's nothing more than multi-touch interfaces. So kind of as we go back to the future in 2010, um, I might reinterpret Michael J. Fox there, and he's not looking at his watch and thinking it's 1955. He's looking at his watch because it's telling him what his blood pressure and blood glucose levels are and giving him a reminder that he needs to take his insulin. So thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, and J John, do we have time to take a few questions? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, I just had a couple of questions. But one in particular, um, recently, I'm a healthcare administration student, and a lot of the classes that we're taking um, are really focused on um, healthcare reform legislation, what's actually in the bills. Mm -hmm. I've taken a personal interest in um, trying to dissect um, most of um, the health healthcare legislation, um, but with specific emphasis on um, public health. It says um, on page one thousand eight hundred and sixty-three. Uh huh. It says um, in a recent paper of the entire health care legislation bill, fifteen billion dollars will be appropriated into a fund account over um, the next decade or until in two thousand nineteen, which is only a one point seven six percent increase. And these are all the funds that are going to be appropriated into. Uh, prevention and public health measures. Mm -hmm. So where um, you had a lot of emphasis on 
public health measures, where is that actually being um, implemented in the legislation mm -hmm. that's now and where we're looking forward because in 2020, I mean, we're only going to have $15 billion appropriated and it's funded. Right. Right. No, it's a, it's a very good question. And um, the, uh, the, ans the answer to it, I think, is we don't yet know. So the legislation has been passed. Um, and those 20, whether it's 24,000 pages of regulations or 22,000, it's the regulations that are going to determine ultimately um, how that money is used and whether or not that money can be increased. So I did an enormous amount of work with the Senate Finance Committee during the crafting of um, the legislation and the, cons the I would say that people's hearts were in the right place in saying we absolutely have to provide universal coverage for folks. Um, but where there is a giant black hole is how are we going to pay for that? So to, to some degree, um, the numbers that, are, that have been proposed in the bill that was actually passed, um, I won't call them placeholder numbers, um, but they're not too much better than that. So I think what we're going to see in the next two years um, are some significant changes in those numbers. And, and the amount of money that's going into primary care is huge, not just in terms of increasing payments to primary care physicians by 10%, but also in supporting the whole concept of medical home and really in completely changing the payment system. So when, when we start to pay hospitals and physicians to work together to manage a diabetic patient, what will be bundled into that, let's say it's $20,000 a year, will be money for prevention. So, and there it's secondary prevention because you're wanting to prevent an amputation, you're wanting to prevent hospitalizations. Um, but I think ultimately that 15 billion will become much, much bigger. So I should come back in five years and find out if I was right. Now remember, um, a lot of the money that they're talking about there just goes to Medicare. And what we know um, historically is that whatever Medicare does, the private insurers do by following. So we're certainly hoping that a lot of the prevention work will also be supported in the private sector. Yes, Wendy, um, back in uh, 1955, health insurance companies had a charity mission. Uh -huh. And in 2010, health insurance companies are Wall Street Cause, rising costs of, of uh, health care, I, I would argue, is directly, directly related to insurance companies. Uh, well, I think, um, it, it, you know, we certainly have seen uh, some, some major and important shifts in, in how health plans um, have provided insurance. And for those of you who are not quite, uh, quite as knowledgeable about this, um, health insurance didn't exist before the Second World War. So it was created as a mechanism for employers to be able to attract new talent to their companies when wages were frozen because of the war. So this is actually, when you think about it, a relatively new phenomenon for us. Um, and indeed, in the beginning, Henry J. Kaiser in 1948 started Kaiser, and he started it for his employers, his employees, um, because he wanted to find a way to give them a benefit. So this is kind of the birth of health insurance as a benefit. 
that was completely, uh, I mean, you can call it a social good. It had a little ulterior motive, which is I would like to grab away some talent from your company and bring it to my company. But nonetheless, there wasn't a big administrative cost or an administrative profit to it. So over time, we've developed a cadre of nonprofit health plans and for-profit health plans. They are highly regulated um, uh, e by each of the 50 states. Now, Medicare has an overhead cost of about 3.2%. Um, uh, this is uh, our single payer system in this country. So those of you who are against single payer, we actually have one here. And many of us look forward to benefiting from it. Um, but a nonprofit health plan um, has a margin of about 15% and a for-profit on average at about 24%. Um, so there are big differences among them. Um, the new health reform legislation, and again, the regulations need to be worked out, um, mandate that health plans must spend a minimum of 85 cents of every dollar on providing direct medical care. So that is going to bring um, uh, the uh, for-profit health plans, um, it's going to bring their administrative cost or force it down to what the government requirement is. Now that's in the legislation. I don't know how it will be regulated. Um, you do really have a states' rights versus federalism issue here because all of the insurance companies are regulated on a statewide basis, and now we have the Fed saying, thou shalt do it differently. And so um, that doesn't give you an answer to the question, but it, I think it gives you a direction and a trend. Um, health reform is really going to put a lot of pressure on the for-profit Wall Street health plans. Um, not to say that the nonprofit ones are particularly efficient and effective either. Yes? Um, how do you see alternative medicine being integrated in? And do you think that it could actually help bring the cost down a little bit? Do you know, um, I, I don't know that it will bring the cost down. The last time I looked, at the numbers um, for alternative medicine were um, three years ago. And at th that time, the best guess, now it's a, little, it's a little hard to track these numbers because not everybody will really fess up, but the best guess that was that we were spending as a society about $83 billion a year on alternative medicines or alternative health practices. Um, so that's a, a big contribution, and by and large, it's out of pocket. Health plans will pay for a number of things if there is evidence in the literature that whatever it is you'd like them to pay for works. Um, now, what's very interesting is, is this is something where I think the patient has a lot more responsibility than the medical care system. Because by and large, most patients do not want to tell their doctors that they are taking um, some sort of herbal root medication or um, echinacea or kind of whatever it is they're doing or taking. Many times they won't even tell them that they're um, getting acupuncture. So if we don't fess up to our primary care docs, that we're actually out, we've augmented their treatment plan considerably, um, then they don't really have the opportunity to discuss it, agree with us, disagree with us, or understand that that um, is a really important major function in treating our condition. Now, obviously, that's not always the case, but in all of the surveys that have been done, physicians don't know what else their patients are doing, and it's because we're embarrassed um, to tell them. So we kind of need to get over that. 
and be able to say, gee, I'm doing these um, two or three or five other things that I really believe are going to make a difference. Yes. I was all prepared to ask a big economics question, but now, um, uh, after, yeah. after this last response, I decided to, to, to ask a, a very specific uh, uh -huh. uh, question, on, perhaps on some inside track that you may, you may have, or, or uh, on your outlook on FDA. Yes. Well, so how do you envision, uh, based on the information that you have, the evolution of the role of FDA given the lags that they, they typically have in drug development, and given all the hopes that, uh, that you, ha you expressed about the, the speed of, uh, of uh, evolution. Right. Um, so the, the FDA is a complicated agency, and yet one that plays a really important part in our lives. Um, the, uh, the FDA is responsible for making sure that any drug that comes to market is safe. Um, and to some degree that it works, but, but its real sole reason for being is patient safety and to protect us from a drug that might harm us. So they don't ever have to say one drug is better than another. Right now, the FDA, um, regrettably because of the laws and regulations we have in this country, um, re requires uh, biotech and drug and in a small degree device companies um, to spend the bulk of their money in development in what we call a, a, a phase three clinical trial. And that is um, when we test out these drugs on 100 to 500 to 1,000 patients who have the disease. Um, for the $1.1 billion that it takes to bring a drug to market, a new drug to market, the bulk of that money is really spent in clinical, the clinical phase trial for, for humans. Um, the safety part has to be maintained. We need to have an agency that protects us. Um, but the prevailing both political and um, public sentiment, and this is probably a small part of the public, but the political sentiment is that, that this should be shifted to looking at how these drugs work in the general population. So if you go back and think about Vioxx as an example, Vioxx passed its phase three trials with flying colors. Um, it went on to the market somewhere between a year being on the market and two years being on the market. Physicians started to make some associations between people who were on Vioxx, Vioxx, having higher numbers of heart attacks. And so they went back, and Merck went back and looked at the data, the FDA looked at the data, um, and decided to take Vioxx off the market. Now, in their clinical trial, they didn't have a patient who had a heart attack. But when you take it out into the general public, which is where we want to know if drugs work, um, they got an entirely different answer. So there's the creation now of what we're calling a phase four post-surveillance trial period. And I think by 2020, that's where most of the emphasis is going to be. Now, in a way, that puts the burden back on individuals. Um, when Vioxx first came out, um, I'd had a really high fever and I had kind of a little temporary arthritis. I felt kind of crummy. And my primary care doc said there's this great new drug um, called Vioxx. It's working really well for things like this. Why don't you take it? So I got the prescription. This is a um, great example of getting a prescription and never filling it. I went home and my husband at that time said, honey, do you know, I've been practicing medicine for a really long time. Um, this drug has only been on the market for about six months. I wouldn't be too happy if you grew a third eye. Could we please wait a year and just see what some of the unintended side effects were? Now, I wasn't too happy with him because I hurt a lot when I got up in the morning, but 
I just took that many more Tylenol. And it turned out, you know, it was happenstance, I'm sure, but he was right about that. So I think <laughs> the cost, you know, we're going to be able to drive down the cost of discovery and development if we can shift the FDA to really focusing their energy on post-surveillance trials, which will give us much better information. But it means you as an individual have to decide, do I want to take the risk? Um, that there may be something we don't yet know about this drug. And so kind of it's what we all keep saying, we want more patient engagement in our healthcare. This is going to be an opportunity to do so that we may not have anticipated. Now, did I answer that question? Yes. Okay. yes. Oh, I was just going to comment that it seems like the phase three, whatever it was, test was also important because some drugs may be, medications may be so dangerous that even in that smaller number of people, something would show up and then it would be better if that didn't get into the general population. Right. And if it, and if it fails phase three, it, it's dead. It's a dead drug. It goes nowhere. Okay, no, I, I was saying I thought you were predicting that, well, you weren't saying they would get rid of phase three. Right. They won't get rid of phase three, but the emphasis, the emphasis now is completely on phase three. So if it works in phase three, it goes to market. There is, there is no tracking of how the drug is doing in the general population. So what I'm saying is that the hope is um, since phase three is the, is the most unbelievably expensive part of drug development, that that money will be shifted out into post-surveillance time periods. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a hook over here. Um, yes? Um, how do you think the new legislation will affect nursing homes and long-term care facilities? Do you know, I don't um, know how it's going to affect uh, nursing homes. I think that um, that we are going to start increasing payments. Um, the Medicare payments themselves for, hosp for acute care hospitals and for physicians, the plan is that they will be decreased over the next five years, but that has been the plan for the past 15 years, and it has, at the last moment, always been completely blocked um, in Congress. So um, there is the potential that there will be more payments. To the degree that skilled nursing facilities um, kind of get a little bit closer to the medical, to the patient-centered medical home concept, because that is going to be the medical home. Then there's going to be a fair amount of funding and a fair amount of innovative things that they can do. Um, but really uh, controlling the costs of acute health care right now and trying to really bolster primary care and change the delivery system so that there's one person well paid, well invested in taking care of you has really been the number one emphasis. Let's thank Dr. Arbor for the talk. Thank you. Thank you.